Howdy friends, uh, it's Jeremy from Eastfield College again, uh, teaching the Toyota program there. Today we are going to go through the rebuild process on a Toyota e-locker diff out of a pre-runner Tacoma. This one here is one that students have had a part, so it may or may not uh, be perfect inside. We'll see what it looks like um, and we'll go from there. So. Toyota diffs are actually quite simple to work on for the most part. Uh, they are, what would you call it? This is a semi-floating axle. So we take four bolt, four nuts off and the whole axle and brakes and everything comes off. Uh, we take our brake line loose, take the parking brake cable loose. Of course, this is a junkyard diff, so it's uh, already been done for me. So let's start yanking this thing apart and see what we can find. Missing a bolt. Now these axles should slide out. It may take a little hammer. There we go. So, it's pretty slick. The axle, the bearing, uh, the bearing retainer, our tone ring for the uh, speed sensor, if it had it, all comes out all in one. So that's kind of a piece of cake. We can set these guys out of the way. Let's see if this one wants to come out easy. Be nice. Smack him by the brim. Right of him. Okay, so on this style of diff, it's got pretty much a sealed outer bearing. So if you had a bearing failure on an axle, you just press it out or press it in. If this were a C clip style differential, like on an American car, if you had an axle bearing go bad, typically on those vehicles, the axle itself is the inner race. So if you, if you have damage to your axle bearing, you certainly want to check the, the wear area on the axle because you may have to replace the axle as well at that same time. Now then if you do are replacing these, this uh, little collar here at the very end, that actually holds all this together. It's press fit and it's not reusable. So if you put in a new bearing, gotta have a new uh, sleeve there. All right. When I'm working with diffs on the workbench, I like to throw them in uh, on jack stands just to kind of hold things while I'm fighting with it all so I don't have to roll around on the table. As soon as we yank this center section out, um, we'll dish the jack stands, dish the housing. But let's see what we get. Uh, now then, we've got our axles out. The housing just comes straight out the front. Nothing fancy there. Now, I've never had one of these apart. I've uh, read about them and looked them up on TIS, but kind of excited to see what's going on inside this thing. Spent 10 years at Lexus as a technician there, and the only time I ever got to take a diff apart was from the body shop when the, they hit something, bent it, which was kind of cool. All right. May need to refer to Tiss on how to get this out. Let's look and see. Removal. There's a picture. It says one here, 
one there. Okay. I'll buy that. Long one. Gonna need a deep for the next one. Okay, so according to TIFFS, this thing should be ready to come out. I'm going to be kind of careful, let it roll down, and gravity's probably going to help me out. Come on, darling. There she goes. Okay, so now this is just an empty steel housing. Not much to it. This guy can go over and out of the way. We don't need it for now. I can lose my jack stands. And then I'm gonna go ahead and chuck this guy up in the vise. So we'll have some help holding on to it. I'll put a rag on the teeth of the, or the jaws of the vise to keep it from uh, scarring up my gasket surface. Maybe that won't fall. Okay, so let's get Tiss over here. Let's see if we can't figure out what we're supposed to do. Okay, so first step in Tiss is to remove the shift actuator for the e-locker. Which looks like it only maybe one bolt left in it after we take those two studs out. Hey, it comes right out. And it's gear drive. I would have never guessed that. So, here's what they want to do. Uh, I'm going to ignore taking this apart for the moment. Just because I don't feel like we need to the way this is arranged in here. I think this whole carrier is going to come off. That fork's going to stay still. And nobody's going to fight us. That's my hypothesis for the moment. We do need to take the nut off of here while we can still use the... Uh, ring gear to hold it so let's take our pinion nut off and once we get that loose it wants us to pull our carrier out so that was easy enough whoever worked on that last didn't tighten it very good it's gonna let me have the yoke we'll do a little three jaw action on this yoke and yank this yoke off or flange as Toyota would normally call it And again, we're not using an impact on our puller, right? Because that would be bad for our puller. Okay. One pinion flange. Spin it around. Let's see if we can get this carrier off and maybe not drop it in the floor in the process. Okay, so you got two little retainers that keep these nuts from spinning. These are carrier preload nuts that preload the carrier bearings. There's one here and there's one here. Uh, and when you get to build a differential that has these nuts instead of shims, it is the best thing ever because they are super. Make, they make building a diff super easy. Um, so we're going to pull those out of the way so that they're not fighting with us first. And then we'll go from there. And that little guy is just a hook that keeps it from spinning. Now then, it looks like a 17 or a 19. Okay, so when I take a diff apart, um, you got left and right parts and you shouldn't mix them up. So what I do to remember what's going on, 
We've got top facing up, it's in the vise. I'm gonna take everything from the left, I'm gonna put it on the left side of my workbench. And then everything that I take off that's from the right side of the diff, I'm gonna put on the right side of the workbench. And that's how I'm gonna keep track of those parts. And when I pull this last cap off, I'm gonna make really, be really careful not to drop this carrier on my feet. So I'm just gonna pull this carrier straight out. Give it straight out. All right, left bearings and all the stuff goes on the left side of the table. Right side goes on the right side of the table. I grab my right bearing cap, throw it over here on the right side of the table. I'm gonna leave that stuff where it is. If I clean these parts, I'm gonna do the thing. Clean one side, put it back on the right side of the table. Clean the other side, put it back on that side of the table. So this is my carrier. And then give it. These are the nuts that preload the carrier bearing. Uh, right and left are a little different on this one because of the locker. It has kind of a fancy one for the left to clear the I guess the shift fork and the sleeve that shifts it in and out of lock. Let's get the pinion out and then I'll kind of give you a description on how this thing works. Okay, that's our shift fork that shifts it in and out of lock. This is our sleeve that locks it up. Uh, you can see my pinion is here. And what I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna take this one to the press and press this pinion out and then we'll be right back. All right, so we're back. I've got my pinion gear. I have my rear pinion bearing and a crush sleeve. Now then this crush sleeve is what sets preload between the two pinion bearings. So this guy is a one-time crush. You're not supposed to reuse it. Uh, I'm going to, we're not actually going to rebuild this one, this is just demonstration, so I'm going to actually take this and use a technique to hammer it back out and stretch it, and then we'll recrush with it. My front pinion bearing lives up here. So let me yank this front seal out. I'll show you what I got looks like, maybe. I'm going to attempt to yank this seal out. Okay, there we go. So, front pinion bearing and an oil slinger. This slinger helps keep oil away from that front seal to keep it from leaking so much or keep making it resist leaking, how about that? Now then, the way this goes, all this sits on here. The flange would go up here and the nut and this bearing would actually come all the way down to this crush sleeve and you would use this nut to crush that sleeve and that'll set the preload on these pinion bearings. And if you don't get that right, it'll either eat the pinion bearings or make noise or then make noise and eat the pinion bearings, one of the three or however that looks. Okay, so the inner races, I'm gonna bring you down here so you can see them, maybe. So there's your inner race right there. It just drives out with a chisel from the backside. There is another inner race right there. If we were replacing the bearings, we would uh, replace both of those races. Now the normal diff repairs, most of the time when I take a diff apart, it is actually just because we have bearing noise. Uh, sometimes you'll take one out to change gear ratios if you're in a high performance off-road application, something of that nature, towing, something crazy. Uh, and then you may be adding a locker to it, again, high performance or off-road application. Um, but usually just bearings. We're in here to do bearings and then we put new bearings in and we get out. So carrier bearings, you have a carrier bearing here, you just press it off and press the new one on. You have a carrier bearing here. Press him off, press him back on. And uh, that's pretty much it. Those four bearings right there are the four bearings in this diff that would normally cause issues and you would replace them. Now then, ring and pinions 
are a match set that are lapped together at the factory or when they're made, wherever they're made. So this gear here has to go with that ring gear. This pinion has to live with that ring. If you swap one or the other out, they're going to eat themselves and make noise. So you shouldn't do that. So this carrier holds the ring gear and the two carrier bearings. It also inside it, it has uh, some spider gears and side gears or pinion gear, side gears, however you want to look at it for the axles. And if I'm really careful, you might be able to see them spin in there. I'm going to take this guy apart so you can see it. The ring gear, you just take these bolts out and then drive this thing down with a hammer, which is going to take a little time and a little force. And you can drive this ring gear back off. When you press it back on, you're going to want to line up all the bolt holes before you start hammering on this guy. Because if you get it off, then you got to drive it all the way back off again. This is a two-piece carrier and it has a line that splits right here. So it's held together with these bolts that go around this um, uh, carrier bearing. I would press this carrier bearing off, but if you look really carefully, it looks like a student didn't do a very good job of pressing this thing somehow, and they've damaged this into the carrier. So I'm not going to press this bearing off because I'm scared I won't get it back on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk all these out by fingers. And it's going to take me a little bit, but we'll separate this thing so you can see what's inside it at least. Okay, so I finally got this thing apart. That was less than enjoyable. And this is the inner workings of a differential. This is what allows you to go around a turn and have the outside wheel spin faster than the inner wheel. Uh, and right now this diff is in open mode. So there's freely and I don't have any resistance there. So these side gears splat onto the axles. Okay. So if the wheel turns, the side gears turn. You good with that? Now then there's one for each axle in here. If it'll let me have this one. Well, maybe I didn't want that one. It's got something hooked on it. There's another side gear here, which does the same thing. It splines onto, I wonder if I can get it off that way. Nope, maybe not. Okay. These here are the spider gears, or I think Toyota calls them pinion gears. Okay. So they're on a shaft. This one's a cross actual shaft, so it's got four sides, which is stronger than normal because usually you just get one pin. And that shaft is uh, captured in the carrier. So if the carrier spins, so when the carrier, here, if this guy spins, that cross spins, which makes these spider gears orbit. Now then, what that means is, if the drive shaft spins, the ring gear spins, and if the ring gear spins, the carrier spins, if the carrier spins, this cross is going to spin and the spiders are going to orbit. Now then the spiders are actually going to drag and push the axles. So now then if the side gear spins, that means the wheel spins. But because of the differential action of this, and if you really want to kind of get a better understanding of this, watch, there's a video on YouTube called Around the Corner. It's a Jim Handy video from 1938 or something. It's very old, but it's the best description of how a differential works I've ever seen. Uh, and I got a lot of cool models. So this is open diff, right? And we're allowed to go around the corner with uh, one wheel going faster than the other. Now then, this particular diff has a locker in it. So one side gear has teeth on the back that line up with this sleeve, okay? And this shifter over here shift this sh shifts this sleeve in and out of that side gear, okay? The outer splines of this sleeve spline into the carrier right here, okay? So this, split, this sleeve will always turn the same RPMs as this carrier. And if that sleeve gets engaged into this side gear like this, 
this side gear is locked to the carrier and when that side gear is locked to the carrier that means that the spider gears they're locked they cannot orbit and that means that this side over here when you put it on there both axles will turn at exactly the same speed all the time the left and the right will be locked together which is useful in uh, drag racing, road racing, off-road situations and things like that. That's when you want to use a locker. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this all back together um, and then I'm going to stick the axles in it and put it on jack stands. Hopefully we can get a little better view of how all that works. So now I have another 10 minutes of trying to screw these bolts back in, which is less than fun. All right, here we go again. So my super awesome jig I've got set up here. Hopefully I can kind of show you an idea of how this differential works. So I put my carrier back in, stab my axles back into the side gears. I got my shifter halfway set where I can adjust it there to shift the locker in and out. Uh, my pinion is not in, so that allows me to turn this guy um, by hand without having to turn the pinion gear. Now then remember there's bearings in these backing plates in the hub here. So the, the hub face for the wheel spins, but the brakes and stuff stay still. Same thing over here. Um, now then, I put a couple white spots on my axles so you can see better these guys turning. So with my sleeve over here unlocked, this we're in normal open diff mode driving down the street. So the pinion gear is driven by the drive shaft. It drives this uh, ring gear. The ring gear drives that uh, little cross that has the spiders on it because it's part of the carrier. So they all spin. And because those spiders are engaged into the side gears, it causes the side gears to spin. The side gears are engaged into the axles, so the axles spin. So we're kicking down the road in a straight line now. All right, so we want to go into a corner. Because of that spider gear, you notice I can turn my axles independently from each other. So what I can do is, we're going to make a right hand turn. I'm going to slow down the right hand axle and I'm going to speed up the left hand axle. And everybody's happy. Okay, so that's how the differential works. If we were going to go the other direction, let's see, let's, I don't know, I have to hold this one. We want to make a left hand turn. I'll slow down the left hand axle and the right hand axle will spin a little faster than the left. We don't lose any torque or anything. It's just we differentiate it from one side to the other through the differential. Okay, now then you'll notice a lot of these cars when you put them up in the air in the lift and you spin one axle and the other one goes backwards. That tells you you got an open diff and you're just turning it through the spider gears. This side gear turns the spider gears, the spider gears turn the other side gear the opposite way. So that's what that's all about. There's nothing wrong with a car. It's supposed to do that. Um, so that's a normal differential. We can go on a straight line. We can go around a turn. We can do whatever. Now then also, uh, you know the guys that do the one wheel peel, the one wheel burnout when they have an open diff? If one tire has good traction and the other one doesn't, this one's going to stay still. And that car over there is going to be doing a major burnout. Now then. If you notice when we took those spider gears apart earlier, there's no bearings in there. So when you're doing that, all those gears are turning really, really fast. And uh, you can end up smoking the inside of this carrier. I've seen that happen on off-road stuff. Uh, guys running an open diff and getting stuck in the mud and burning them up. Um, so don't do that, it's bad. No one wheel peel. And if you get stuck, get somebody to give a strap. Pull a winch out, winch you winch out of the mud. Um, so let's go to locker mode. So when I slide this sleeve in, if you remember this sleeve was splined to the side gear and then it also has teeth that would engage in the carrier. So if I move this sleeve over, now it's locked in. So this side gear that was splined into this shaft is now splined through this sleeve into this hub or the carrier. And no matter what you do, 
they're locked. There is no going around a t there is no going around a turn and one side going faster than the other. This guy is locked together. So if you were stuck in the mud, one wheel had traction, one wheel didn't. You lock it up and away we go. If you're at the drag strip, when you do your burnout, it only burns out one tire, you lock it up, both tires spin. We put 100% of the uh, torque to the two rear wheels. It doesn't get differentiated between the two. Then, once we get out of the mud, we unlock the diff and she's back open again. Okay, so that's an e-locker. Uh, this fork here is just moved by a little electric motor with a gear on it that causes this fork to slide in and out. Um, and there's a button on the dash and makes it engage. Pretty simple actually, and kind of cool from a factory vehicle to have a, to have a factory locker. But that's the Toyota e-locker. So now I'm gonna take all this back apart and we'll go through the reassembly process and test on how this, to see how this works or how, it, how it's reassembled. Okay, it's time to put this guy back together. Um, we're not rebuilding it, remember? So uh, we're gonna reuse all our bearings, all our races and stuff. So if we were putting in new races, we would drive in the new races for the pinion. Um, we would uh, install our new pinion bearing here, the rear one. We'd have a new crush sleeve. Now then, most differentials, you put all this together and then you measure the pinion depth because the depth of the pinion will impact your wear pattern on your gears. Um, ironically, Toyota doesn't uh, mention you inspecting that. Uh, and typically what I find is you're supposed to have a special tool to measure pinion depth that I've never seen. I've been in a lot of shops and I've never seen the tool. I've seen them on TV, but yeah, nobody has that tool. So nobody really does that as far as I can tell. So there are shims between this bearing and the pinion in there. And in my experience, if you reuse your old shims, your pinion depth will be very, very close. Um, I've never had an issue with one that I have to change. So if you're putting in new ring and pinion or new bearings or whatever you want to do, reuse the old shims and that will get you there nine times out of 10. So we're going to throw this guy in there. I'm going to go ahead and throw my crush sleeve on. And then I'm going to have to put in my front bearing. Let's see if I can spin this around so you can see where we're at. So this front bearing is going to go in here. And this guy is a press fit. So I'm going to take this to the press. I'm going to support the bottom of the pinion gear, press on this bearing and get it installed, and then we'll be right back. Okay, I took this to the press, pressed in my pinion bearings. Everybody's good. I didn't press them really tight because we don't want to crush that sleeve with the press, but just enough to take the free play out of it. My uh, dust seal goes in. I have my really busted pinion seal now that needs to go in because I'm going to reuse the old one for this demonstration. Uh, I might consider using a, uh, a driver for that, but that one's already pretty well boogered up, so I'm not sure it matters a whole lot. So we'll throw our flange back on. And then I'm gonna draw it up with the nut, I believe. Tighten it to 273 foot-pounds or less with this special tool to hold this. Now then, I've never seen anybody use that special tool. Typically, you see guys put it on with the impact. Um, I've tried it once and it was not any fun, so we're gonna do it with the impact. We're not gonna go tight though. We're just gonna go up till it touches. <laughs> And, until it stops spinning and then we're going to uh, check our preload. Okay, so, and I was using a rag to hold the gear to keep from cutting my fingers up. So, pinion preload, how tight we squeeze those two bearings together is very important as to how long they last and how much noise this thing makes. So that needs to be perfect. So to measure pinion bearing preload, you use a beam and needle torque wrench and it's a tiny little guy. It measures in inch pounds. And so the way we're gonna do this is, 
We're going to spin it around about five or six times just to get everybody settled down. And then we're going to spin it and monitor our torque as it spins, which is kind of a neat trick because you got to follow it around with your face. Now looking in TIS, it says new bearings should be 9 to 14 inch pounds. Reused bearings should be 5 to 8 foot inch pounds, excuse me. So, and we're, we're at pretty much nothing right now. We're at one or two. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go in and blip it once or twice with the impact and then check it. Nothing so far. And we're not going far and we're not going hard here. Just a little bit at a time. If we go too far, we'll crush the sleeve and then we'll have to replace the sleeve because it's a one-time deal, remember? Still not there. We got a little bit coming on. Let's measure it just for, see what we get. All right, I'm just talking two or three. Still want some more. Hit it kind of hard that time. Hit it even a little harder. Oh, that feels nice. All right, I have some that I can feel now, so I know I'm going to measure it. In fact, this is kind of a neat trick to do this. Okay. I'm coming up on that four mark. And we're at four to eight, so I'm gonna go a little bit tighter than four. I'm gonna get closer to the eight because I want it to be a little tighter. go I've got I'm calling that seven or eight let's call it seven and then we'll do the rest of our calculations based off of seven because we need to memorize that number so that we can figure out our total preload when we install the carrier bearings and that thing just feels really nice um, granted if we put new bearings it'd be much tighter but Use bearings always go a little bit less. So let's spin this guy around. Now we got to put the back end of this thing in. Okay, so still have all my right stuff on the right, left stuff on the left. So all we got to do here, slide this guy into the carrier partially. Put this race on this side, this nut on this side, this race on this side, this nut on this side. Stab the races into these smooth parts right here. Stab the nuts into these threaded parts right here. Stab the fork onto that little sleeve all at once without dropping anything. And then magically install these bearing caps without losing anything. So this might be a neat trick. I'll see how I do. My finger's happy. Don't smash your fingers while you're doing this too. Be nice, go in there. Oh, I'm making it look easy today. That doesn't happen all the time, I'm not gonna lie. Two people would make this job a little bit easier. I'm gonna get this bolt started first and then put that nut in. Okay. All right. I'm not tightening these bearing caps. I'm just kind of getting them up close because I want to be able to spin these spanner nuts and make sure they sit down in their uh, threads right. If you get one cross-threaded, it can make life exciting later on. Got 
Got my fork in there, he's happy. Got my bearing caps close to where they need to be. I'm going to break out my ultra custom spanner wrench and then uh, we'll start setting this guy up. It needs to go that way for sure. That's part of my problem. Okay, spanner wrench time. Okay, so I've got everything in here nice and happy. My caps are still loose. I got my nuts centered so that they turn freely. Uh, this guy's out of the way. Everything's good. So now we need to set backlash and preload on this gear. So backlash is when we hold the pinion and we rock this gear back and forth. Uh, now right now I don't have very much backlash which means the pinion is here which means the carrier needs to go away from it to increase my backlash. And I've got is loose so I've got no preload yet but we'll, we'll, we'll get our backlash close and then go from there. So for a spanner wrench to turn these nuts I just took a piece of scrap panel and welded some pins out of another differential into it and I'm going to turn these nuts. So if I need the carrier to go that way I'm going to tighten this nut and loosen this one which is going to cause it to move that direction. So let's see what we get here. And I'm not going to go crazy and try and get it all at once. Ooh, that sounds better right there, just the way it is. Okay, so I got a little bit where it's starting to get tight over here. I got backlash that feels kind of good. Let's measure backlash. Let's see where we're at and know which way we need to go next. I'm going to put my dial indicator up here. I'll rearrange it so that I like the way it fits. Okay, I want my dial indicator in line with my gear as much as possible so that when I move it, you see that needle moving? That's my backlash. When I look at TIS, backlash specification is somewhere. Backlash is five to seven thousandths. Okay, so that's pretty tight. We got way too much backlash at the moment. And when we're going to torque our bearing caps to 63 foot-pounds, let me grab a torque wrench. We may actually follow the procedure today. This one will go down that far, won't it? Uh, yeah. Okay, so I got my torque wrench ready. And I'm looking for a total preload or add about five um, inch pounds. Okay, so I have too much backlash right now. I've got close to 10 thousandths and I wanted, uh, it's gonna be hard to memorize all this at once. And I want five to seven thousandths. So I need to bring this gear this way. So what I'm gonna do is come over here, put my spanner wrench in this gear here in this nut and tighten it up. And when I tighten that nut, it's gonna move my carrier this way. So we're still a little over 10 thou. So I need to come this way some more. I come over here, I'll tighten up this nut some more. And my, if you notice the carrier and everything's moving all together and that's okay, that's not gonna hurt nothing. Everybody's just kind of happy where they're at. So changed my angle up. My dial indicator wasn't cooperating. So let's get a little better view. So right now I only have a couple thousandths of backlash. So we came a little too far this way. Now I need to go back that direction. So I'm going to tighten up this nut here. Let's see how far we get. Okay, I'm up to about three or so. I'm going to go ahead and bring this nut down a little bit closer or bolt down a little bit closer because we're getting close to where we want to be on things here. And as I tighten these up, it's going to pull them together. So I'm going to give it a go and see what we get. I might just go ahead and torque this down and see what happens. Mm. 
Okay. Let's see what that did for us. What do we got? We got too much. So we need to go back this direction. Let's go ahead and tighten the other side and let's see what we get there. That one's already pretty close, wasn't it? Need to switch to a chrome socket. That one doesn't fit very good. So we're going from six to 12. So that's six thou. We got six thousandths of backlash. Our specification is five to seven. So we're right in the middle of that. So I'm pretty comfortable with what we got going there. So backlash is close now, right? So what we did was, we'll recap that. Put it in there. It was way too loose. We sucked it this way. Um, it got too tight, we pushed it back and forth. We pushed it back and forth till we got close to where we wanted to be. Um, and every time I was just continuing to tighten this thing together and start to put some preload on it. So now we'll measure our total preload and see how much squeeze we have on these bearings and then decide where to go next. So it's a kind of a step-by-step -step process here. Let's see. I'm actually gonna use a torque wrench for this. Okay, so those are torqued. I, we can, I'm not gonna check it, it's, it's still right. It still feels good. Now we wanna check our preload. And if we remember earlier, we had seven inch pounds up here. So when we added in that uh, carrier bearings, we're gonna increase the preload up here and that's where we're gonna have to turn this thing from. So, but we're going through the ring and pinion ratio on this, uh, preload back here, which increases some drag and also, but reduces the amount of torque it takes to turn this thing. So you would normally take whatever we added here, multiply it times the ring and pinion ratio, and that'll get you close to what your actual preload is. TIS just says, we want to increase our total, from, from our seven that we had earlier, we should go up three and a half to five inch pounds. So we're gonna give her a couple spins. Let's see what we got. I'm showing 10, maybe 11. Okay, so from seven to 11, that's four. I'm not scared of that. If you wanna go a little bit tighter, we can. Let's go back and check our backlash one more time. And if we think we need to move our backlash, we'll tighten up one side. We'll bump that preload up a little bit maybe. And also, get a little bit more precise on the backlash just because. Okay. I'm going from 86 to 89. Is that right? Uh, we've got about four thousandths backlash. Our specification was five to seven. So it wouldn't hurt to tighten up my preload a little and it wouldn't hurt to scoot this carrier that direction. So what I'm gonna do is tighten up this nut, which will squeeze the bearings together and push that carrier that direction. After I loosen this up a little bit. I'm gonna put them back in finger tight just to keep my uh, spanner nut from skipping. We're gonna give this guy a little push. About like that. Gonna retorque it. Now let's recheck that backlash and see if we made any movement there. Okay, so my uh, dial indicator was making me insane. If you want to know if I actually use dial indicators, well, I've used one enough to wear one out. So I have this vintage one that I picked up from my father-in-law and uh, it's harder to read, but it does actually work. So I just changed my rigging a little bit, going with a new dial indicator. So I tightened this nut, increased our preload, 
which should also have increased our backlash a little bit. Let's see what we get. So I'm showing about six thousandths, which is right in the middle where we want to be on that. Now then, if you, earlier, if you remember, I was rocking this and it was really easy. Now it's taking quite a bit of force. So my preload has come up significantly. We ought to have a nice preload now. So let's go over here. We're going to give her five or six spins. Yeah, it's definitely stiffer than it was. It may be a little too much. We'll check it and see. So we were going to add three and a half to five inch pounds of preload to our seven or eight we had earlier. So let's see what we get. Let's see if I can hold everything and not shoot it across the room. Spin everything to get everybody settled in. I am rocking 12 thousandths right now, 12 inch pounds. So we had seven or eight, we went up to 12, so we added four or five somewhere in that ballpark. I feel like that's awesome as far as it feels nice. That's a good amount of preload for pinions and total preload actually, because you got the pinion and carrier bearings involved in that. So we'll spin it around. My backlash is perfect. Now I should be able to go in and check my wear pattern on my gear. So let me find my grease for that. Okay, so I got some grease here, but hopefully it's not too old, uh, to paint onto my gears to inspect my wear pattern. Um, they have special grease for this. If you don't have any of the special grease, uh, I've used Lubriplate a lot of times. Just the white lithium grease works pretty pretty okay. It's not as prevalent, but it'll work. And we're going to paint both the drive and the coast side of these teeth and check the pattern in both places. So, and also normally you would check this pattern in like four spots across the diff, but I'm only going to check it in one today. Somebody's already put some Prussian blue from school on this one. So we're going to get some multicolored grease today. All right, so looking at my teeth, one of them is slanted, that's my coast side. One of them is pretty flat, that's my drive side. And it's concave and convex. Concave is the coast, convex is the drive side. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn this guy and see where the grease gets wiped off. Now then, you can't just turn it. You gotta load it up so it actually squishes the grease well. And typically what I'll do is I just wad up a rag and shove a rag up here in the top uh, in the housing so that it uh, puts drag on that carrier and makes it harder to turn. Okay, so we made it around. And let's look at our wear pattern. I'll bring you in close for this one. Okay. So, and maybe we need a little more light. Ah, that's better. Okay, so you notice right here, all the way through the middle of this, it wiped the grease off of that gear. Okay, it's not towards the, the heel or the toe. It's not towards the top of the bottom. It's just right in the middle. And that is a beautiful, perfect wear pattern for the drive side right there. Um, if you wanna memorize the chart to know what you're supposed to adjust to correct a bad wear pattern, you can, I'm never gonna do that. I just Google it and go, if my wear pattern's towards the heel, I need to do this. If it's towards the toe, I need to do that. And we'll go from there. Uh, Cause by adjusting the backlash and the pinion depth, we can move that around, move that wear pattern around. So let me see if I can get my rag in the bottom here and then we'll check the coast side of this gear. We'll get it close. I'm gonna shove my rag in there tight. Uh, I've seen service manuals that actually said stick a pry bar in there and squeeze a pry bar against it, which is one way of doing it too. Works pretty good. But I've always got rags handy, so I use that. So let's check the coast side of this gear. Okay. So, you can notice again, all this space right in here, the grease got rubbed off. You can see the excess grease down in there in the very bottom. So we know that it touched, there's a little dab of excess grease at the top. So we touched, I mean, 
the majority of that tooth. That is the beautiful, beautiful wear pattern. This differential will not make noise if the bearings are good. So at least it won't make noise because of the wear pattern. And then so you can see the drive side, nice clean in the middle. See the coast side, nice clean in the middle, clean in the middle. That is a perfect wear pattern. Um, and actually having those spanner nuts makes that possible, makes it easy to do this. So if this were an American diff, other than like the four nine inch, so if this were an F-150 or a Silverado, there would be shims on each side of these instead of these nuts. And so you've got these shims, you put the shims in, and if your preload, or let's, let's start with backlash. If I wanted to increase my backlash on one with shims, I would add to my shim. I'd take my shim out, measure it, see how thick it is. I'd go to parts and I would order, because they're not gonna have it in stock, order a thicker shim to move it. So if I wanted to move this guy two thousandths this direction, I need two thousandths thicker here and I need two thousandths thinner here. If I wanted to increase my preload, I'd figure out which direction. If I just wanted to increase preload, I could add a thousandth on each side or two thousandths on each side and it would squeeze it without affecting my backlash. But let's say I need to move it two thousandths that way and increase my preload. I might order one that's like three or four thousand sticker for this side and leave this side alone and let it squeeze it together like that. And the, the shims are there, they take more work, more time. The spanner nuts are amazing. Um, this is kind of based off what a Ford nine inch rear end would look like. If you're familiar with it, everybody loves a Ford nine inch rear end because it's got spanner nuts here. And the other cool thing about it is five bolts in the front and this whole front section comes off of it and the pinion comes with it. And so the pinion on a nine inch has an extra bearing at the back, plus there's shims right here. So if you need to change your pinion depth, all you gotta do, five bolts, pop it off, throw in a shim, five bolts back in, rock and roll. If we wanted to change pinion depth on this because of our wear pattern, we have to take all this apart, press our pinion gear back out. We would have to get our rear pinion bearing off of the pinion without damaging it, which is really difficult to do. So typically you're gonna to have to buy a new pinion bearing, at least the rear one. You're going to change your shims to increase or decrease your pinion depth, and then press it all back together, put in a new crush sleeve, and then go from there. So changing the pinion depth on this is, is not any fun. And based on what we see here, we don't need to, which is awesome. Uh, again, if you'll reuse your old shim when you're doing your pinion bearing, you're likely to end up with a scenario like this where it lines up and looks nice and good. So, I think that's a carrier. We torqued these, we torqued that. Pattern's good. We're ready to put this thing back together and assemble it. So let's put this shifter back on. I might as well put back in these plugs that we took out. Oh, I got one more thing to show you too before we get too carried away here. Um, we need to put the retainers for those carrier nuts on. These two plugs back in. Okay, so one of the first things we took off when we started this were these little hooks. So this little hook goes on here and it keeps that nut from spinning. And I'm gonna get hosed and it's not gonna line up with anything today, aren't I? When this is bolted together, that hook's there and this cannot come loose for any reason. I'm gonna torque it to spec with whatever it says in the gun. It feels like specification. There we go. I did a little tweaking on that one to get it to fit. Um, if you wanted to, you could actually move that nut, but I don't want to change my settings on this because I got them perfect. So, tighten that guy up. Tap it into place like that. That nut's definitely not gonna move. Okay, so there's that. We got our lock sensor that goes on. There's locking switch to let it know, let the computer know that we locked up. I don't know if it's a computer, if it just lights up a light on the dash. But we're gonna torque it about that much. 
Uh, this guy's cool. Uh, you would probably want to put a new O-ring here to make sure this guy doesn't leak. And probably put a little lube on that O-ring to get it in the hole where it goes happy. Oh, and I gotta line that up. There's your problem. Unlock it. Install it. Oh, and it goes like it's supposed to. And pay attention to what you're doing while you're doing all that, I guess. I want to put these two studs in to help line it up while I go ahead and install this one bolt that held it so that when I get ready to install this into the housing, everything still lines up. And that's it right there. Pull that guy out, that guy out. I think if I had a housing, we could assemble a differential. Let me clean this workbench off and we'll put this guy back in. Okay, got my housing back on, my jack stands on the table. Got my carrier up here, he's ready to go in. So, this surface here has to hold differential oil and you wanna clean both of these surfaces really well. Um, and then I usually hit them with some brake clean before I put my glue, my form and place gasket and glue them on. Let's see what we get for um, specifications for oil in that. I bet the nuts are gonna get some oil as well. It says, remove any oil from the carrier assembly contact surface, install a new gasket. Man, this thing never had a gasket. This thing was glued. So, I would use the black at form and place gaskets, probably what I would use. If you're doing aftermarket stuff, there is RTV made specifically for gear roll and it works pretty good. So let's put this guy in the hole and see what happens. And I got my fork on the right side. I'm gonna attempt to do this without smashing any fingers or getting hurt. Come on, get in there. I may need a little bit of assistance. Get it nice and straight. There it goes. And it just sat in the hole. Now then, I'll throw a couple of these nuts on there to hold it. I can lay it down on the jack stand while we finish the rest. Okay, he'll sit there. And give me a gun with a 12. Torquing these to 18 foot pounds, it says. Two long ones for the uh, shifter there. And I need a deep to get one of those on. Some of these studs came out with the uh, nuts. Probably wouldn't hurt to uh, pull the nuts off the studs and reinstall the studs with Loctite on in the housing. Okay, so we'll pretend I torqued those and they're in. So this part is done. Now it's time to slide the axles back in and turn this thing into a diff again, I guess. Okay. There's a, there's a seal right here that you would normally replace uh, and it seals against this surface right here. 
So when you're sliding this in, you want to be very careful not to damage that seal. All right. Now then gravity causes that axle to want to climb up at that end and pivot off right here. So in order to hit that side gear, you're going to have to line this up a little bit and get it to slide in. And there she goes. Now I just got to hit the holes in the diff housing. There it goes. There's one. Breaks up. And in she goes. Now then normally I would go ahead and look up the torque spec for these, wherever it's at in TIS, and torque these to spec. But since this thing is just a display diff, I'm going to go ahead and torque them with the old air gun here. right there and be nice. So we got a diff. If I spin this one this way, that one should be spinning the opposite direction. I'm going counterclockwise. That one should be going clockwise because we're unlocked. And that's what it takes to put a diff in, to build a diff. Put some grease in it and call it a day. Um, thanks for watching, guys. If uh, you want to see more of this kind of stuff, um, we've got some engine rebuild stuff coming on this summer. I got a bunch of high performance stuff coming up too. So like, click like and subscribe, please. If you want to make some money in an uh, essential field, look us up at eastfieldcollege.edu and make some real money working on Toyota stuff. Look us up at t-ten.com. I'll put the links to both of those in the description below. Thanks for watching.